Good morning. What a blessing it is to... How are you? Doing better than me, probably. Pray for me. Anyway. No, no, I'm good. Um, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6. And if you want to stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, we are going to read a small portion of Mark chapter 6, but then we're going to uh, frame it in in its context in a way that might be something that you haven't realized before when you've read this story. So, Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw them, and take note of that, straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. That was about the fourth watch of the night. He came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. <laughs> I love that. When they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Amen? So verse 46 said, When he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Let's read that out loud. When he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Father, open your word to us. We pray by your Holy Spirit. You said you would lead us into all truth. We ask you to do that this morning. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. You can be seated this morning. It's uh, almost a famous story. Jesus walks on the sea. And all the way to uh, back when there was Sunday school and all of that, it was one of the first little Bible stories that we taught the kids about Jesus walking on the sea. And there's a lot that can be said about it, and you could preach 14 campaigns out of the Scripture. But one of the things that I find is interesting is that most people don't actually put this text in its context to understand what kind of day Jesus had just had. And so I want to take a minute and put it in that proper framework, and all of a sudden another message comes to the foreground. And isn't that the beautiful thing about Scripture? You can read it and it speak one thing. You can pick it up the next morning and read it again, and the Holy Spirit, right, will bring you something else. It's so multifaceted. And so, so I'm not going to bring you a strange doctrine. I just might be bringing you a new reminder because we're a soundbite culture. And so we read the story of Jesus walking on the sea, and we focus on the story, and we talk about the story. But sometimes you have to back up a couple steps and put the thing in context. For homework, I would encourage you to read all of Mark chapter 6 later today if you've got some time, because it's really interesting. It's one of the worst days Jesus had in his entire three years of ministry. If you put the text in context, Jesus has had a terrible, terrible day. Now you say, well, Jesus couldn't have bad days. Of course he could. He came here to be touched with the feeling of our humanity. He is divinity wrapped in humanity. He would not be a good savior to you if he didn't know what it was like to be you. And so he had every kind of thing, the scripture tells us, Paul later says, tempted in every way that we are. He wrapped himself in a flesh that's no different than yours or mine, and he walked this out so that he could be Emmanuel, God with us. And so he very much walked through this world in the same capacities that you and I do. And when you take the time to put this event in its context, Jesus had just had a terrible, terrible day. It began with some ministry time that he describes a few verses before this as being so hectic. There's so many needs. There's so many people needing ministry that it says they hadn't even had time to eat. Right? You can picture it. A crowd pressing in on Jesus and they just, everybody needs something. Now, I know most of us don't know anything about what that's like, but to be surrounded by people with their hand out 
And I don't mean that as a criticism. If you were crippled, if you were broken, and you knew that he was the Messiah, of course you went to him, and he wanted you to find him and all of that. But it doesn't change the fact that the humanity of Jesus, pressed about by a throng of people that need so much, that even as he delegates to the disciples, okay, fine, you pray with them, and Peter, you get over there and help that guy. Even with all of that, The Bible describes a day so hectic that they haven't even had time to pause and have a meal. About this point, some new disciples walk up that aren't normally with the crew, and Jesus recognizes them as being disciples of John the Baptist. And they walk up with news. John has been beheaded in prison to entertain an adulterous woman who has decided to sin by calling the prophet of God to account for her own sin. And so Jesus, who had defended John valiantly, you remember the story when John began to doubt, are you the one that's coming or should we look for somebody else? And the scripture says that's when Jesus gave that stirring defense. No man ever born of woman was greater than John the Baptist and you were willing to rejoice in his light for a season. Now the news comes that when John had prayed, he must increase and I must decrease. That they would have had almost no idea that the decreasing of John would be broken all the way down to him being killed for sport so that his head could be an object of ridicule on a platter at a king's luncheon. And the reason why we can deduce that this affected Jesus is because a few more verses before this, he says to them, let's get out of here and let's go find a place to rest because it has impacted him. We know from scriptures we just looked at a couple weeks ago, Jesus is touched with the pain of humanity. If he was not, he could not be the savior that he is. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about him at the tomb of Lazarus, and the scripture says that he wept because he saw the pain and he saw the turmoil in Lazarus' family at his passing. You're not talking about a cold, aloof Pharisee. How many are glad? We're talking about a kind, compassionate man who is touched with the feeling of other people's pain, and this affects him enough that with a crowd around, he says, we need to get out of here. We need to go somewhere and we need to rest. But if you keep reading, you find that that plan did not work. That they left from this place, and the scripture says four or five verses before this, that the multitude deduced where he was going. And they ran around the lake ahead of him. So that when they got to the other side, instead of this respite that he wanted they were there thousands of people still saying we need you and in fact we find that them following him to the other side of the lake just made their situation worse because now they are in a deserted place where there's no place for them to eat and the miracle that we call the feeding of the 5,000 happens when Jesus is completely exhausted The scripture says they gathered around him and he looked at them as one who had compassion. And the disciples come to him and they say, hey, we got to send them out of here. This is a deserted place. There's no place for them to eat. It puts a different possible different context, doesn't it, on Jesus' initial response. You give them something to eat. See, we read that verse and we divorce it from the humanity of Christ, but the fact is he's worn out. You give them something to eat. The the boys are like, have you counted it up, boss? (laughs) We know Philip, the accountant, is in the corner with his abacus. 50, 50, 50, 100, 100, 100. There's like 5,000 people. So he says, fine, 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 fine. Have them sit down. Even that has a different context, doesn't it? Stop pushing me. Sit. Sit. Fine, I'll take care of it, but sit down. Have you ever been around somebody that you're like, I love you, but sit down? 
just please, I'm going to do this for you, but just please, just get out of my personal space and sit down. See, we, we read this stuff and we don't realize this happened. This is not a myth or a fable. This is an eyewitness account. And even today in court, there's not supposed to be anything stronger than an eyewitness account. This is written down by men who saw it and willing to die over it. This really happened, and it puts a possible different light on Jesus saying, please just sit down. Please, just sit down. Fine. How do you want us to have them sit? <laughs> just, just groups of 50 or 100. What, just sit. How, what do you have? They go, uh, like uh, five loaves and... Two little fish. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> so, so we know that miracle, too. We've read it. Blesses it, breaks it, begins to distribute it, moved by his compassion. You know, compassion is what you need when you get exhausted. I'm going to sidestep for a minute and help you. If you find yourself getting grumpy, what you need is more compassion than you have irritation more compassion than you have exhaustion, more compassion than you have frustration. You've got to have more on tap. Don't wait for the moment where you're so holy that everything in you just wants to be nice. May not be coming, brothers and sisters, but you've got to have more compassion. Yes, I'm tired, but they didn't do it. Do you know that this whole culture is being ripped apart by misdirected aggression? Right now, I'm mad. I didn't do it. Well, but I'm still mad. I didn't do it. Sit down. <laughs> Some of you got your word from the Lord in that. You're like, I'm good now. I'm going to go home. Because now, now I know it's biblical to tell a hysterical person, zip it, please, and just sit down. It's in the Bible. I've got a point of reference for it. It's right there in the scripture. Would you please just sit down? Jesus feeds them all on the worst day. He's been trying to get alone with his father all day. And everywhere he goes, the needs just press in till we arrive at our text. This is the context of it saying, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. See, you've got to put the text in context. I know that's not popular on television right now, but we really need to do it as disciples of Jesus. Put the text in context. Why did he send them away? Because he was done. I have done it. I taught you everything. I healed everybody, and I even gave you dinner. Now go. <coughs> I love you, but that's it. <laughs> so he puts the disciples in the boat. It, it brings Gethsemane into stark relief, doesn't it? Because on the worst day of his life, he still didn't ask any of them to stay and watch and pray. So when you see the Gethsemane account and he begs three guys to watch with him, gives you some little hint the amount of anguish in his heart in the garden that night. For on this worst day, cousin John has been killed for sport. I've been pouring out ministry all day long to everybody who comes to me and I just need a break. He still didn't need the boys. Get in the boat and go. In fact, <laughs> he might have needed a break from the boys, <laughs> if, we're, if we're just honest. I, I, know, I know that the Catholic Church has made heroes of all of them, but when we read the Gospels, they're a frighteningly human bunch, aren't they? And you can just picture, especially if, you ever have, if you've ever been blessed with children, you can just picture 
the arguments. Jesus is exhausted. We need to get this done. He turns around and here's James and John. I'm going to tell mom. I'm going to tell mom because I want to be in charge and you didn't even help with the bread. I saw you, John. You didn't even break any bread. And you know Jesus would just be like, ah! You say, well, he wouldn't be like that. You haven't read your Bible. He gets so mad at him in a few weeks, he turns around and says, how long am I supposed to put up with you? It's in your Bible. Don't look at me funny. I'm telling you what's in the book. No, this was a human bunch. So now it's break time, and he's like, I'm sending away the multitude, and I'm even sending away you. <laughs> Go. Get in the boat. Leave. When he sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. What he needed was time with his father. I want to encourage you this morning, my message is actually very simple. But you're going to find that the more challenging the days get, what you need is time with your father. And to get it, you're going to have to send people away. Not permanently. <laughs> I'm not talking about blowing up all your relationships. But if you are a person that always answers your phone, if you are a person that automatically responds to every text, if you are a person that an email in your inbox just plagues you until you answer it, if you're a person that no matter what anybody asks of you, you think it's your Christian duty to say yes, because obviously doormat is a spiritual gift if you're i'm just i'm i'm trying to help you we are in a culture that manipulates everybody if you love me do this for me if you really loved me you would do that for me and i'm telling you if you want to survive the last days you're going to have to learn how to put some people away for precious modules of time and get alone with god if you make time for it, you'll survive. And if you don't make time for it, you won't. Because this fight is not going to go to those that have a keen intellect. It's not going to go to the person who's just determined. This is going to be won by people who have figured out how to walk with God. Now, for those of you that are bracing, oh no, here comes the sermon on prayer time. Get up at five. Have an egg timer. Stay there on your knees for 45 minutes. Memorize a scripture. No, that's not what I'm talking about because that's not what Jesus is modeling here. Do I have time to really give you something? Jesus is modeling something the church has had stolen from it. And I want to help you understand it. Jesus is modeling intimacy. Now, because our culture is so weird... Intimacy now just means something sexual. But if you actually look up what the word means, it's not sexual at all. It's the personal opening of a heart. If you break the word down, intimacy is into me see. Into me see. The fact of the matter lost on our culture is you could be intimate with a person you don't have sex with, and you can have sex with somebody you aren't intimate with. We've messed it all up in the name of all of our romance TV shows. But intimacy is when I take my heart. If I have an intimate moment with my wife, it's when I stop pretending that I'm the pastor and I stop pretending that I'm a strong man, and I open my heart, and I'm vulnerable with my wife, and I tell her things like I'm afraid, and I'm scared, and I'm trying, and I can't do it, and I need you. The average man in America doesn't even know how to do it anymore because we watch too many dumb John Wayne movies. The reason why a lot of marriages are not a refuge for your heart is you're too busy trying to act like you're tough. God didn't send you your spouse so you could pretend and put on airs. He was trying to give you somebody who you could safely open your heart to. Now, whether you find that in your marriages or not, the beauty of the gospel is it's what you're supposed to find in God. 
a safe place to drop all your acting and be intimate. Into me see. The reason most people tried having a prayer life and got bored is because they wasted all the time performing for a God you can't fool. We've been taught so many ridiculous things about walking with God, it blows my mind when I hear the guys say it. If it was up to me, I would start visiting. If I win the lottery, now of course I buy about one ticket per year, so my odds are not good, but if I win the lottery, I'm going to start going to these big churches to heckle. I'm just going to sit on the third row, open an actual Bible, and be like, bring it, Bubba, because I've actually read this book. Because this stuff is crazy. Oh, you don't dare get before the Lord and confess any doubt. Yeah, you fooled him. He's not the God of the, of the universe with perfect knowledge of everything in your heart. No, you tricked him. You did. When you memorized that scripture, you came in and you were like, for I believe I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And in heaven, God was like, oh, cool, I believe her. What? What? Do you know you waste time praying about stuff instead of being intimate? And we lose the opportunity to be changed because all we do is get with God and rehearse what's wrong with someone else. We get in there, I'm going to pray for my husband. I'm going to pray for my wife. I'm praying for my kids. You better watch. Because if you're not careful, all you do is pray about them. That's different than praying for them. Preacher's in the book this morning. I'm helping you out. You get before the Lord and you rehearse. I'm praying for my boss. Are you praying for your boss or about your boss? Two different things. Oh, God, get him. Show him how awesome I am. Cause him to get off my back. He's a jerk. Okay. Yeah, because God didn't know. <laughs> I, they're still preaching this funny one. I just saw it the other day. I was clicking channels, and it landed on a Christian station before I could stop it. I, I, hit, <laughs> I, I hit last, but it had already landed there. With the guy going, remind God of his word. He didn't forget it. God is not confused about what he said. He's mostly confused why we read it and don't do it. I'm reminding you, Lord. I, I think he turns to Gabriel sometimes and is like, is there a memo that I'm forgetful? What do you mean reminding me? I wrote it with my own breath. I know what I said. How about you stop squawking for five seconds and let me remind you of something? You know, <laughs> preachers in the book, I know this hurts, but it's good. Everybody just say, this is good. See, because Job one time was arguing with God, telling God all that he knew, telling God he had it all figured out, and railing on his friends because he had it all figured out. And then when God finally answered him, the Bible says Job's response to God was, I spoke when I should have been silent. And I thought I knew, and I knew nothing, and I'm out. Just bailed right out of it when God finally answered him. Because we're not needing to inform him. See, see, people will get in this mode, it's tough times, I'm going to tell God what's happening. So, 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 so we, we, we get along with God, and we, we go, God, because you know, you know, uh, you know, my, my wife is sick, and, and then my job's not going right, and, and Lord, you know, I really want 
you know, whatever. I, I want an AR-15 before they're illegal, and I don't have enough money. And, and then that guy wants to sell me one out of a trunk of a car, but I don't know if it's legal, but I want one. I need wisdom. And we're praying about all, the, like we're informing him. Did you know? Did you know I had a bad Tuesday? Father, did you realize that my heart was broken on Wednesday? Get her, God, for doing that to me. What ends up happening is no trade-in happens. Let me help you. You rehearse the problem to God. And you say, I prayed about it. But you cannot leave behind what you hide. Into me see. I'm going to give you a secret code on prayer that will blow your mind if you go do it. Stop informing him. He knows. The only thing that really needs to happen in your quiet place is for you to open your heart and give him your junk. We want to pray till he changes something. What he's trying to change is someone. We want to pray until it goes different, and he wants us to pray until we walk through it different. We're trying to figure out how to get him to do what we want, and he's trying to figure out how to get us to grow up enough for it to not matter whether he does it or not. If you want to come out from behind that rock and walk on top of what everybody else is straining against, you're going to have to learn how to lay stuff down when you pray, and you do that by being intimate. Jesus modeled it for us in Gethsemane. It's how I know he did it here. He was so honest that theologians struggle with Gethsemane. If it's possible, take this cup from me. Code, I don't want to do this. Is there a better plan? I'll do it if you insist, but this is awful. Into me see. Now, I'm going to tell you something that you're going to have a hard time believing if you're religious at all. And I feel like we mostly have flushed out most religious stuff from our spirits or we wouldn't still be here. But just if there's any holdovers, if I was going to guess, Jesus sent that multitude away. And he went and he sat down probably on a rock or something behind another rock there by the ocean. He sat down. The boat was leaving. And I bet he prayed something like, O oh, gracious, omnipotent, heavenly Father of all the universe, thou hast arest the bestest of all the bestest. For thine, O oh Lord, is the kingdom, the power, the glory, the glory, the power, the kingdom, forever and ever and ever and ever. No, no, no. See, see, this churchy stuff is killing us. I'll bet you he prayed something more like, God... I want to kill Peter. <laughs> I'm so sick of him. Why did you make me pick him? You go, oh, but he wouldn't, but he would. Because he knew the secret of intimacy. Into me see. This is hard. I'm your son, but you gave me a body that gets tired and hungry. My feet are sore. I'm hot. I'm dirty. And everywhere I turn, they keep pushing in. And if I wasn't wearing this flesh suit, I'd be fine. But I've got a flesh like theirs. And why did John have to die like that? He did everything right. He was the most faithful man you ever called. Everything you asked him to do, he did it. Every message you asked him to preach, he preached it. Everything you wanted him to do, he was faithful to do it. He was the greatest man that had ever walked the earth. 
and his death was sport. I knew that he had to move out of the way for the Messiah to come forth, but like that? His head on a plate, Father, what? How does that even? And then what the heck is going on with Andrew? Every time I turn around, the boy is flirting with a girl. Every time I try to keep an eye on him, I ask John to watch over him. John wants to call down fire and kill him. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with these disciples you made me pick? Read the Bible, brothers and sisters. It says Jesus prayed all night, came down and picked 12. He didn't need all night to get 12 names. He needed all night to deal with what the 12 names were. He would have gotten with God and been intimate. Into me see. There is a lot of disappointment. Confusion. Conjecture. In the body of Christ right now. And in this room. More than we talk about. And if you want to get over it fast. Don't go tell God scriptures he knows. And don't get alone with him and pretend you're faking him out. You lay down before him and you go, you know what my problem is? I'm mad. I don't like what I see and I don't like how it went. And I wasn't even ready for it because people were telling me lies about what was coming. And now I'm disappointed and I'm mad. And you go, I don't think I could talk to God like that. If you understood his love, you could. Because it's what's already in you. See, we try to hide it, and he goes, what are you doing? I'm looking right at it. When I was a little boy, I was little once. I, I know, you're like, what? <laughs> really, what was? Um, and... Um, when my dad first taught me how to play hide and seek, I don't think I got it. Because I thought if I couldn't see him, he couldn't see me. It just wasn't working out. I'd go behind the chair and put my head under the curtain with my spindly little white legs sticking out in the living room, and be like, ready or not, I'm, I'm ready. And then my dad, if he was having those rare kindnesses, would just look. <laughs> See, a lot of people, a lot of people really try to find a badge of courage in their childhood. My father wasn't kind to me. The fact is, my dad didn't have a lot of evidence that I was going to do well, okay? <laughs> like, I mean... Yeah, I wish he was nicer, but he didn't have a lot to go on that this was going to turn out very good at all. Okay, okay, <laughs> just, just being honest. He woke me up on a Saturday morning three months after I got my driver's license. He said, get up, let's go outside and take a look at what you've done. What did I do? Well, you were drinking last night. I was not. Okay, so where are all these cans on the floorboard of your truck? They're Rudy's. Of course they are. Let's, let's go look at this. I had hit a dog that had gone over, was dead in the back of my truck. And I'm there trying to deny it. And he's seen it. And he's like, did you hit a dog last night? No. Are you, that's crazy, really. Let's come over here. So you stopped and picked it up. Um, so see, he didn't have a lot of evidence that this was going to turn out, okay? Even when I went to visit him the last time, right before he passed away, he went into a coma about two weeks. I went home to see him. It was around a Father's Day, and a two, about two weeks later, he went into a coma, and he was in a coma for four weeks, and then he died. And on the last time that I saw him, he accepted Christ, which was awesome. But even then, we sat together, and he said, so you're still in the Navy, like he was waiting for them to kick me out. That's, 
Like, and come on, we're not talking Army Airborne. We're not talking Marines storming. The, all you got to do to be able to make it through a Navy enlistment is show up. And my dad was like, you're still? Really? They haven't? Wow. And he was so shocked. I didn't give him much to go on. Okay? But here's the thing about being human. We do the same way with God, our Father. I'll hide it. He can't see it. And the whole time, he's like, what? Why don't you just trust me with that? I knew about it before you did. I read a cool quote the other day where the guy said, Christian counseling is just paying other people to talk until you find out what God already knew. You're not fooling him, so stop trying. If you want your prayer time to count, don't rehearse and don't perform. In 2 BC, I'm depressed. Just tell him. He knows. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not depressed. I'm an overcomer in the name of Jesus. I could do all things by the power of the blood. And the Lord is really, really just take a breath. I got just sit down. Let's have a real conversation. I am not bitter. Tell your face. Please. Could we stop doing this stuff? You can sit with people now. You know you need to forgive them. I did. Really? <laughs> no, no, no. You would get over stuff faster to go to the, before the Lord and trust his love for you and go, here's my problem. I know you said forgive him. But I've been pondering how to set fire to his car with him in it. So I think I need some deliverance here. <laughs> I was thinking of him polishing a bullet that was already shiny. So maybe, and, and you go, well, that's crazy. No, people that are honest with God actually get over stuff. I've been pastoring a little while. And I'm going to tell you right now, the most bound up, miserable people in churches are people who never drop their guard with God long enough to just be intimate. And they navigate collecting hurts, collecting offenses, and then striving to deny it all. No, 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 no. And what they always wind up is just worn out and exhausted and then the devil convinces them they failed. And they didn't fail to do anything except get before God and just be real. Are you doing all right? Can I give you one other little piece to prove my point? There's an Old Testament story that's pretty awesome about this guy named Naaman. And he had leprosy, but he hid it. And then a word came from the Lord through the maid that, that if he would get to the prophet in Israel, he could be healed. Naaman has a problem, though. To get permission to go to Israel, he's going to have to tell his king why. He's only in charge because he hid it. The scriptures are clear. Only people in his house knew because he could hide it under his robe and under his armor to get permission to go get his healing. He was going to have to trust his king enough to go to him and say, oh, king, live forever. I must journey to Israel, and I must see their prophet and be healed of my leprosy. He had to tell it to get permission to go. And I'm telling you right now, some of you need healing from stuff that is as far away as you just dropping all this church stuff and telling your father plain, I'm just depressed. I'm just broken inside. I'm so disappointed 
by what they've done. And I'm so angry about how it makes me feel about myself that I could puke. And I don't know what to do. And the first thing your father says is, thanks for telling me. Let's, let's do that. You can't leave behind what you hide. But anything you give him, the exchange happens. And when he takes what's in your heart and gives you what's in his, he's not broken. I'm in the Bible this morning and I'm helping you. He's not depressed, which is why if you can get clean and honest before the Lord and give it to him, that's why you walk out on top of the water. Oh, see, if we were down south, we could get after it. You come out walking on top of what other people struggle with if you can figure out how to get along with God and be intimate. This is where I'm really at. I shouldn't be. I know it, and you know it. But your word says you love me to the uttermost. And that nothing can separate me from your love, including me. So help me, Father. I know it's not your heart that I'd be this angry. But I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I'm not. Help me, Daddy. I should have more compassion than I have frustration, but I don't. And instead of standing here trying to perform for you, I'm just going to give that to you. Help me. Because I should be more like you than I am. And by the time Jesus gets done praying, he comes down to the shoreline. It's dark, so he's looking. They haven't even made it across the lake yet. And he's like... This is why I need you. You told me to call fishermen. And this lake is only three miles. And I've been praying over here for hours. And look at them. Out there arguing about who's rowing more. And so he starts walking it's the coolest thing in the Bible. Only thing cooler is the resurrection. Just starts walking. And that's why it says he was going to pass them by. Think about it. Well, if you're going to do that, I'll see you over there. <laughs> walking on top of the water. See, because we, 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 we frame it weird, man. We get religious. We think like every step he had to declare a scripture or something. No, he's just walking. <sighs> he's getting closer. Pull on your oar more, Peter. God, I'm doing all the work over here. Andrew, pass me a sandwich. Who's gonna, did anybody see what the boss decided? Who gets to be in charge next time? Because I got the short end of the stick passing out the fish. They were stinky. <laughs> Walking on by. But then they saw him. This is a problem he had all day. People kept seeing him. Who's that? <laughs> See, that's, 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 like I said, they weren't giving him much to go on. We only been apart about four hours. What do you mean, who's that? We've been together every day for two and a half years, and who's that? Who did you leave behind? It wasn't Peter, it was me. Who's that? But notice he had his grace back, walked over, got to the boat, and said, would you stop flipping out? Walt translation, 2021. Would you pump the brakes just a little bit on all this drama? It's just me. It's just me. He gets in the boat, and the storm's over. 
learn the lesson of getting alone. That song we sang earlier was on purpose. Run to the Father. And when you get there, fall into his grace. Don't get there and perform. Run to him and fall into his grace. Why? Because he knows everything wrong with you anyway, so you might as well get there and be honest. And lay this stuff down. I know that we're angry, and I know that we're disappointed, and I know that we're confused. We're not going to get through it by trying to pretend we're not. We're going to have to trust his love enough to just get with him and go, this is horrible. I don't know much, but if this is your master plan, you need a new plan. And if you're lucky, he won't answer you out of the whirlwind like Job and scare you. But even if he did, he didn't kill him. He just showed up and said, boy, now you answer me. Sorry, I'm good. Even if you make him mad, he won't kill you. That's got to be good news for somebody. Amen? Why don't you stand with me this morning? Learn how to run to God all the time and make time. Push away what you have to push away. And if you're married, I'm telling you, it should be a completely acceptable thing in any Christian household for one to tell the other one, can you just take care of all of this for an hour because I need to go in here and get alone with God. In any Christian home, that should be an absolutely acceptable course of action. Fine, I'll watch the kids. Don't feed them because you'll mess it up. I'll order a pizza. But if you need time, honey, <laughs> because we all got to understand we're just in this together and we all need our times with God. Amen? Father, teach us to trust your love for us enough that when we are with you, we just open up our hearts and give you what's really happening. We don't need to perform for you, and we don't need to pretend. We just have to be real. We can't lay down a burden we're in denial about. We can't get healed from a brokenness that we refuse to acknowledge. When you said ask and you would receive, I can't ask if I'm in denial about what I need. So, Lord, we're putting aside all of this performance Christianity stuff. Your love is new. Your mercy is new every single morning. And when I need you, I don't have to put on an act for you. I can just run to you and fall into your grace. Teach us how. God, teach us how. We will not make it through these challenging times if we don't learn how to find our refuge in you. And there's a level of it, Father, we can do when we're together worshiping. And I'm grateful for that. I love worshiping with the saints. But there is a level where we've got to be alone with you. Because to be really honest, there's some stuff nobody needs to hear but you. So teach us to make the time. Teach us to put away the multitude bothering us even for just a module of time to get alone with you and make the transfer and give you what's in our hearts that we might receive what's in yours. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness. We ask you, Father God, to seal this word in our hearts that our instinct all throughout this coming week and month and year would be to just run to our Father. And we give you all the glory in advance for the changes that you will make in us. You may or may not change what's happening, but you'll change how I'm walking through it. And I can go from straining against the wind to walking on the water if I can learn how to get with you and lay it down. So we give you praise, God, and ask you to teach us your ways. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. God bless you. I hope you learned something. I hope the Holy Spirit was able to use something in all that madness to minister to you.
and uh, we will see you soon. I got a no quick poll. Super Bowl is in a week. So, um, <clears throat> my boy Tom Brady went to Tampa Bay, never cared about Tampa Bay in my life, still barely do, but I would like prayers for Tom. <laughs> He's not a young man anymore. And, I, and I, I want him to beat Patrick Mahomes badly. I want Patrick Mahomes to go home and on Monday morning be like, wow, somebody finally taught me how to play football. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. <laughs>